morning. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Amanda Reinhart, and I'm a forecaster with the National Hurricane Center Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. I'll be the moderator of this talk, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask it in the chat box, and I'll try to bring it up during the natural pause of the presentation or at the very end. Today is part one of our winter weather webinar, and it's going to be given by Dr. Chris Lancey, who is the branch chief of the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, and also Chris, or, sorry, uh, Darren, who is the branch chief of the Ocean Prediction Center. Uh, the first talk will be given by Chris, so why don't you take it away, Chris? I can't hear you. I can't, I don't know. Let me make sure you're not muted. Um, it doesn't say you're muted. Can everyone else hear him? Okay, I can hear something. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Take it away. All right. Okay. So uh, my name is Chris Lancey. I'm the branch chief of the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch here at the National Hurricane Center in Miami. And uh, we don't just do hurricane forecasts. We do winter. We do marine weather all year round. Winter, summer, spring, and fall. Uh, and our area of responsibility is the tropical North Atlantic. Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Atlantic. Um, I'll be leading off and then my counterpart, Darren Fergurski at the Ocean Prediction Center, will uh, will discuss the, uh, the uh, high latitudes of the North Atlantic. Uh, and then tomorrow both of us will talk about the Pacific Ocean. So specifically the, uh, the area of responsibility that we have here in Path B, as our branch is called, um, has 10 million nautical square miles. And so uh, that includes not only the East Pacific, but the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic. Uh, the high latitudes of both oceans are, are done by the Ocean Prediction Center up in College Park, Maryland. And the Central Pacific, for those fortunate enough to live in Honolulu, um, they uh, is done by the Honolulu Forecast Office. So our area of responsibility um, for the blue water mariners, anyone going offshore, uh, it has hundreds of ships on a daily basis. I was shocked to see this, and this is from marinetraffic.com. It gives you a live idea of uh, what large ships are out there, whether the uh, red ones, the uh, oil tankers, uh, the green ones that are cargo ships, uh, the, uh, the purple ones that are um, giant personal yachts, uh, the blue that are tug, uh, light blue that are tugs, and the, the dark blue that are our cruise ships. So I was amazed to see when I, when I was uh, helping out a couple years ago for this position, just how many ships are out there. And uh, we wanna make sure that they are accessing the, the most up-to-date weather information, winds and waves and uh, warnings so that they can adjust their ship route so that they can stay safe and safeguard their cargo, whether their cargo is oil or food, so in the Atlantic, uh, during the winter time, uh, I'm not talking hurricanes, we're talking the winter season, uh, we do get cold fronts that uh, reach the, the subtropical latitudes. Uh, so this shows a diagram of where our uh, most likely gales are to occur in the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico, south of our latitude. So it's south of 31 north. Basically, Jacksonville is where we take over. And so the areas that are most likely to get gales are right off the coast of Colombia because of the interaction of the Bermuda High and the semi-permanent low that's over the country of Colombia. So it's very often that there's a gale force winds uh, just north of Colombia. Uh, also, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, when we get a strong cold front, uh, it's very common to have uh, gales in the uh, Bay of Campeche in the southwest Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, and so that shows up in red. It's a very common area for gale. Um, also, uh, 
we do get gales on occasion um, in the Northwest Caribbean, just off Belize and Honduras, uh, and then in between Cuba and, uh, and Haiti, uh, the, uh, I guess the Windward Passage tends to get gales on occasion, as well as just east of Florida. And then the areas in yellow uh, are less common, but occasionally we do get gales on just about any of our area of responsibility. Uh, it is of noteworthy that um, the main area of gales are near gaps um, between mountains and high coastal terrain. So it's that interaction between the Bermuda High and other weather systems, along with the uh, very steep topography of mountains near the coast, that can help uh, produce some of these very strong winds. So some of the tools that we use on a daily basis, uh, you know, we do have ships that are in the voluntary observing ship network, and those are wonderful to get wind and wave information. Uh, we also have more buoys that the National Data Buoy Center of NOAA operates, which gives us continuous uh, wind information, wave height and wave direction, wave periodicity. Uh, we also have information from space. So we have um, an altimeter. So it's uh, several uh, satellites rotating around the Earth several, day, several times a day. Uh, that gives us significant wave height over the open ocean. And these are accurate to the nearest foot. It's amazing how the information we can get from space. And then these colored wind barbs are also from a satellite called a, a scatterometer. Turns out the United States doesn't own any scatterometers right now, uh, but we do get three scatterometer passes from the European Space Agencies. Um, uh, so we do get information that way. Also, a key tool for us is the satellite imagery. And just a couple of years ago, the United States, uh, NASA, launched two billion dollar satellites. Uh, one is, uh, that focuses on the Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea all the time. It's a GO-16. Uh, so this is some imagery from, uh, from just yesterday. Uh, and we now have uh, pseudo true color information that, that helps our forecasters out as, as well as gives a, a beautiful view of our, our planet. It's important for us to have this view because often we don't have those measurements over the open ocean of what the winds or waves are. So the information, the imagery we see helps us to identify features that may cause strong winds or high waves. Some of the other tools we use on a daily basis are our computer models. So for example, on the left is an, uh, from the Global Forecast System, which is run by the National Weather Service. Uh, so it gives us great wind information out through several days. And we also have a, a wave model called Wave Watch 3 that's driven by winds from the global forecast system. Uh, and we run an internal wave model as well. So if we uh, take a blend of wind model output from say the global forecast system, along with the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, then we can run a wave model that's consistent with our wind grids that go from the initial time out through six days. And finally, some of the tools we use are the workstations that we uh, have on a daily basis. And we're in the process of switching from uh, the National Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System, or NAWIPS, to a system that all the local forecast offices use called AWIPS. And so uh, it's good for us to be on the same platform so that way we can share information, share forecasts, and make sure it's consistent because the mariner doesn't care when they're going from 61 nautical miles offshore to 59, even though that's crossing our border with our local forecast offices. So we wanna make that as seamless as possible for the winds and the waves and the warnings. So for the blue water mariners, that's the focus for this, uh, this talk. How do you get information out over the open ocean? Uh, well, if you're on a cruise ship, everybody on the ship has high-speed internet access in their pocket when the cruise ships are running. Hopefully again soon they will be. But a lot of ships over the open ocean don't have access to high-speed internet. And so there's a variety of ways that um, mariners can get information about the weather forecast. Uh, if they're close to shore, then they can get um, either NOAA weather radio or high frequency or very high frequency radio. Uh, there's also a, a medium range frequency broadcast by the Coast Guard called NAVTEX for a few, a few larger the ports. Uh, and you know, over the last uh, decade or two, uh, Inmarsat provides satellite transmission of text products, uh, in particular the high seas forecasts and warnings. 
that we in the Ocean Prediction Center and the Honolulu Forecast Office issue. And just this year, Iridium is a, another company. They're going to be also providing satellite transmissions of high, uh, high seas forecasts. And I uh, just heard a presentation today by Iridium that they're about ready to go operational with that. Um, Mariners can also, if they have any kind of uh, uh, email access, they can request products, uh, both text and graphics by FTP mail. Uh, and uh, for those that have low bandwidth, uh, we do have a marine composite page where we can show uh, images of our winds and waves and warnings in a very low bandwidth methodology. So I want to walk through a few. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Sorry, Chris, to interrupt you. Some people are saying that your um, your sound is going in and out. I don't know if you could like talk closer to the microphone or something. Um, sure, I can I can try that. Okay. So I give that a try. So. All right, sorry. Just want to make sure everyone's hearing it, okay. So a key um, aspect to making a forecast by meteorologists is understanding what's going on now. Uh, and that includes being able to diagnose the weather patterns. And so we actually do a unified surface weather analysis every six hours. It's a combination of what we do at the Hurricane Center, the Ocean Prediction Center, Honolulu Forecast Office, and the Weather Prediction Center. Uh, WPC does uh, North America, uh, well, un United States and Canada minus Florida. Apparently, they don't think Florida is part of the United States. Once you've lived here a while, you realize that's true. Let me give an example of the uh, surface analysis that was done today. Uh, so this was the one issued at 12Z. Uh, and so you can see the cold front that went through the area uh, of Florida and now is stalled out over the Caribbean. Uh, it's got a surface trough that's still producing some showers. And so this is the uh, kind of foundation for everything else we do. You have to be able to fork, uh, understand the, the features that are causing the winds and waves before one can uh, start making a forecast. So we have one main uh, discussion product. It's called the Tropical Weather Discussion. So we focus this time of year on uh, any gale events or storm that's uh, uh, 48 knots or greater uh, in, in our area of responsibility. And again, it goes from the equator up to uh, 31 north. Uh, I'll quickly uh, just show an example from, from this morning's text product. Um, so, it, so we do have any warnings, it's a special feature. Otherwise, we break it down into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Caribbean Sea, and the tropical North Atlantic. And the first paragraph is typically uh, an assessment of what's going on now. And then the second paragraph goes into uh, a brief discussion or synopsis over the next five days. So when we provide the wind and wave forecast, we do provide it in a variety of uh, methodologies. Uh, we still have the, the legacy um, text forecast uh, that is issued through the uh, Global Marine Distress and Safety System, GMDSS, uh, that's required by all large ships over the open ocean. Uh, we do do graphics, um, both uh, internet-based as well as marine facts. In the last several years, uh, gridded information over our, our, our full domain. So depending on the technology available on the ship, depends on you know, how they can access the, for the forecast. Uh, all of our forecasts, it's important to know, are based on our gridded information. So it's, it's our forecaster um, enabled grids where it's value added information, where we're blending together the best wind information and wave information to make our forecast. And then these grids inform our text products as well as the, the graphical products. So everything we do is kind of in a gridded format and then everything else pops out from that. So an example, uh, the high seas, again, this is the, the legacy product that uh, is required by international law through the International Maritime Organization. Uh, and so this gives a snapshot at the initial time, 24 hours and 48 hours about what is going on over the Gulf Atlantic or Caribbean. And we focus on winds of at least 25 knots or seas of at least eight, at least eight feet, because uh, those are the ones presumably getting more of the attention by the, uh, the blue water mariners. Another key text product is the offshore zones, and it's where we provide in each of these polygons a forecast out through five days, in this case, 
um, where you get more detailed information of the winds and waves that are currently out there and any warnings that are going. So we have a, a GUI that, that allows for, um, for surveying the forecast. So for example, what was provided by uh, Maria Torres this morning as our Atlantic forecaster, uh, she's indicating um, possible gale um, in the next, uh, in about on Monday as a possible gale conditions uh, for the Southwest Gulf of Mexico. And it's, that's a key area where uh, we often do get gale, gale events. Uh, additionally, there is the nav text. So it focus, focuses on um, the Gulf Coast, uh, the Florida Peninsula, and, the, uh, and, and Puerto Rico. And so this is a blended product that has our information as well as the local weather forecast. Uh, and we heard loud and clear uh, when the, the Coast Guard did a survey last year, there are still quite a few mariners that use the Navtex uh, for making decisions as they're approaching or leaving ports. Additionally, there's the Vobra product. So this is again broadcast by the Coast Guard. Uh, it's a high frequency voice broadcast. I'm not sure how many mariners still use it, but that's uh, that's a product that's available as well for those that have receivers uh, for high frequency. So for the marine radio facts, and there's still quite a few vessels out there uh, that they require this information um, and they don't have high speed internet. Uh, and so the transmitter for the uh, Gulf Caribbean and the Western Atlantic in our area is, uh, is out of New Orleans, operated by the Coast Guard. So I'll walk through a couple of the key products that we do on a daily basis. Uh, so we do a day one, day two, and day three surface frog. That is, what are the features that are responsible for the winds and waves? Whether it's uh, frontal boundaries or uh, troughs or the intertropical convergence zone, uh, we issue this twice a day. And to show you an example from what was done this uh, uh, last night, uh, so this is a three-day forecast verifying uh, the one of the 13th at zero Z, where we have a cold front entering the Gulf of Mexico and a stationary front farther east. Not as much going on, fortunately, uh, over the next couple of days. So when we look at wave information, we start with a sea state. So uh, what are the current wave heights that are going on today, as well as uh, what's the, the dominant wave direction? Um, so this is not a forecast, but it's issued twice a day. Uh, for our Atlantic areas of responsibility. When we get to the forecasts of both winds and waves, uh, we have these progs that go out through three days uh, and it's issued twice a day. And uh, again, we'll take a quick look at the three-day forecast that was issued last night by Dan Mundell. And as typical, we have that peak. There are about eight feet seas just north of Columbia. Uh, can be much larger than that when there's gale conditions and then there's some uh, swell from uh, the north that's uh, causing a com combined winds and wind waves and swell up to about uh, 13 feet in the northern part of our area. So we also provide uh, twice a day at, for, at uh, two days and three day lead time, uh, the dominant wave period and direction. Uh, and this, this is both color coded on our website as well as a black and white version that's sent out by, by Marine Facts. And then finally, this time of year, we do a snapshot at a 48 hour time frame, um, basically because there was a, uh, a window in the Marine Facts schedule where we had an opportunity to put a, an extra graphic. So several years ago, this was designed to give a mariner a kind of 48 hour heads up of where a warning may be at that particular time. Uh, so this is issued four times a day during the uh, winter and spring, uh, and it shows where there's any active warnings that are going. So we do want to move ahead and provide higher technology solution. And so for those that do have access to the grids, um, then they, they have a full grid, gridded information out through six days. Uh, but for mariners over the open ocean that may have um, some uh, low bandwidth uh, internet capability, we do have our marine composite page. And so it's basically showing pictures of our grids. So on the right side, it shows the wind bars for, our, this is a real strong cold front from last January. And in color shows a significant wave height. And this is a forecast out through uh, about three days. And on the left side, it shows uh, a graphical depiction of those winds and waves, as well as the features that are responsible for them. And so we can actually take a look at what's available today in the Atlantic Basin uh, grids. So 
I'll bring up the 10 meter winds. I'll bring up the uh, significant, uh, so let's go wind barbs. I'll bring up the significant wave heights. And we'll also put on the uh, features that are available today. And so this is as of 12Z this morning, uh, and then increments in 12 hours. So this would be valid for tonight, uh, tomorrow morning, and so on. Uh, so our features go out through three days, and our gridded information we provide here go out through five days. Um, it's the same thing, the wind barbs and uh, uh, show the wind speed and direction, and the colors represent the significant wave heights. Uh, so again, it's a quick way to get a visual interpretation of winds and waves um, that are going on. If we had any uh, warnings, uh, that would also show up in these uh, high seas graphics. Uh, so there is a warning. In this case, the warning is out of our area. It's in the Ocean Prediction Center's waters uh, at about 35 north in that red area. Oops. Okay, so let me go back to... Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. So one aspect that we do also provide uh, for the U.S. Coast Guard uh, whether it's District 7 here in Miami or District 8 in New Orleans, our spot forecast. And so this could be for any incident out over the open ocean that requires their attention. It could be a disabled ship. It could be a, a missing ship. Uh, it could be an aircraft that may have crashed, crashed over the open ocean. Uh, it could be a person overboard. It could be an oil spill. Uh, it could be um, you know, legal issues that they're dealing with of, uh, of, of, of drug run or interdiction. Whatever they're dealing with, and they need a forecast because the weather is going to impact their operations, we're able to provide it. So last year, we gave uh, 54 of these spot forecasts. The majority of our, were for this particular transoceanic tug, the Bourbon Road, which was going across the Atlantic. And for some reason, uh, still unknown to us, they sailed right into Hurricane Lorenzo and it was a Category 4. And so this 100 and 40 foot uh, tugboat was hit by 30 to 40 foot waves. They took on water and they sank. And fortunately, the, uh, the vessel uh, that, that, that three of the mariners were rescued, uh, but another eight were lost at sea. Uh, we do have a nice write up about that. So um, I would uh, suggest taking a look at uh, Brad Reinhardt's write up about uh, our efforts, as well as others in NOAA. Um, to assist the U.S. Coast Guard and the French Navy with these search and rescue efforts. Finally, I uh, do want to talk about our social media. We do have a, a Twitter page where we uh, issue tweets uh, automatically if there's any warnings in place. Uh, so those go out um, on a daily basis, at least twice a day. So, for example, you can see uh, uh, a couple days ago we issued some warnings over the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Atlantic. Uh, for warnings. We also do uh, manual tweets uh, when there's something of interest going on. So, for example, this uh, was issued uh, several days ago about the Gulf of Tehuantepec and the, uh, the gales that we often get there uh, in the Pacific Ocean. So, one aspect that we're hoping to start providing uh, in the new year uh, would be weekly weather marine briefings. And so this is going to be either once a week or twice a week where we provide uh, an overview over the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and West Atlantic uh, as uh, from our forecasters. And so I'll just give a little Hello, snippet everyone. from this. Hello, everyone. This is Maria here at the National Hurricane Center Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch for today's Marine Weekly Weather Briefing, Friday, October 11th. So just a Northern little example. Over I impacting mainly the western Atlantic and also the northern portion of the. So I just want to give you a, sn a snippet of that. Again, we're hoping to start providing that live um, twice a week on uh, via a YouTube channel. Uh, if we get all the permissions set up to start to providing that new service, it's not a new forecast. It's just a new way to deliver the information to the mariners uh, over the open ocean. All right, so I just want to wrap up. Uh, we have uh, 16 uh, men and women that work here in uh, Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. 
And our mission as meteorologists is to provide you the best wind and wave forecasts and warnings um, so you can stay safe and you can also um, make sure your cargo, whether it's uh, oil or bananas or, or people, um, so that uh, we know that uh, can be very risky and, and sometimes life-threatening occupation being out over the open ocean. Um, also do want to point out our, our website for our Atlantic forecast and our phone number. Uh, we have forecasters 24 hours a day. So if there is a marine forecast question, uh, we can answer. Um, so I think I will uh, stop there. And, uh, and so Mar uh, uh, Amanda, did you want to do questions now or should we wait till the end? It's up to you. Um, we have a couple of, we have about like six or seven questions, but do you want to save it to the end? I'll leave it up to you. Why don't we save it to the end? Okay, sounds good. Let me go ahead and get this up here. Um, All right, Darren, I just made you presenter. There we go. All right. All right. Just doing a quick sound check. Sound check. I can hear you. Very um, good. Can you guys let me know if you guys can hear him. Just want to make sure. So All right. right. Okay, people can hear. Go ahead, Darren. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, good day, everyone, wherever you're at. And with the presentation, appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to spend part of that with us. And so I'll minimize the go to meeting and hopefully you can see that. I'm going to try to get rid of. Um, can you see just my presentation, Amanda, or do you see your face right in front of it? Um, I see your presentation and I also have the webcam on. Do you want me to drop off? Yeah, if you can, please. Yeah, thanks. So just want to step through again. I'm, I'm Darren Fergurski. I'm the operations branch chief at the at the Ocean Prediction Center, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the centers do at the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Uh, both uh, Chris at the National Hurricane Center's Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, and me at the Ocean Prediction Center, we're part of nine centers that make up the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Other centers you can see there on the screen. But uh, everything is, um, all the different centers do things with aviation purposes, space weather, uh, severe weather prediction. Uh, we do climate prediction, environmental modeling is done. Uh, the Weather Prediction Center does a lot with uh, quantitative precipitation forecasting, winter weather, as well as analyses in the near term, as well as in the medium range part of the forecast. All of the information that we're able to send out and all the model data that we get uh, is aided courtesy of our NSEP Central Operations. So where Chris and I are part of nine centers of the of the NSEP um, yeah, environmental prediction. And, and as Chris pointed out, our Atlantic, the, the, since this is focused on the Atlantic, the Atlantic forecast area for the Ocean Prediction Center is mostly the blue and the light blue. Uh, Chris already described the area that the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch does in, in the green. And we do, for the high seas purposes, for the uh, for the purposes of those those warnings out over the high sea, we go out to 35 west, but our radio fax charts will go out to Europe and Africa. And all of this area is part of med areas that are established around the world. And in the United States, we have the responsibility for med areas four and med area 12. And in the kind of the projection we have met area four kind of wraps around a little bit. So that's why I put the circle on the on the left side of the screen as well. But again, as Chris mentioned with the Ocean Prediction Center, we do basically north of 30 north. Um, the the, uh, the tropical analysis and forecast branch does south of about 30 north in the Atlantic and in parts of the tropical Pacific. And then we have an office in Honolulu that does the rest of the tropical Pacific Ocean. These med areas are important because each of the nations here listed is the authoritative voice for the warnings uh, that are issued for marine purposes in their areas. And so uh, while I, I, it's obvious that a number of uh, mariners out there are getting weather from a variety of different sources, 
when it comes to the warnings, the gale warnings, the storm warnings, the hurricane force wind warnings, along with heavy freezing spray warnings, um, all of those need to have an authoritative source. So there aren't many uh, stoplights at the intersection, if you will, that there's one source of at least those warnings to make sure people are making the right decisions to keep them safe. And why do we do what we do? Well, I wanted to mention that over the Atlantic Ocean, especially in the northern part of the Atlantic, when it comes to hurricane force, extra tropical lows, uh, not just the tropical lows, a busy year for tropical weather. Obviously, this year as we were getting well into the Greek alphabet. But from hurricane force, low pressure systems themselves, every year there are an average of about 45 uh, that occur uh, in, that, in, in the North Atlantic. And those don't include the gale force uh, wind events that we warn for and the storm events that we warn for. So in, in the Ocean Prediction Center's area, in the Atlantic, as well as in the Pacific, we're issuing up virtually 10,000 warnings every year for upwards of 45 uh, hurricane force lows. So it's quite a bit. It's a very busy environment, particularly in the wintertime, with very progressive uh, systems that are going west to east across the ocean. And I also wanted to bring this up, you know, why we do it. This is um, an example of many uh, alerts that we get courtesy of the National Geogra Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And a lot of these alerts will be for cable laying, for rocket launching, um, for uh, different events that are going on over the ocean. But back in March last year, there were just in five days, there were 18 events of, of, of a vessel adrift, people going overboard, people missing, and so on, or just, just vessels in distress. And it's for, for the hurricane force lows, it's for this reason why we do what we do to try to keep people safe. And in addition, this is an example over the Pacific very recently. This is from September of just uh, this year. But there was an event with a hurricane force low in the Gulf of Alaska, getting ready to move up toward Alaska, which had 40-foot seas associated with it. But on the left, we have a kind of example of some of marine traffic. This was courtesy of Sea Vision software. But there was really good avoidance out there. So, you know, they're the whole weather enterprise, not just the National Weather Service, but everybody who's getting weather information or providing that weather information was doing a pretty good job, I think, getting people to avoid the weather. But there were a couple of vessels in there that were getting really close to some pretty extreme conditions. And it's our goal through the warnings that we issue, through the forecasts that we issue uh, on hopefully what we think be a timely basis, that people are able to make the decisions that they need to. Uh, to keep their vessel safe, to keep their cargo safe, to stay out of harm's way. And so what we do, Chris has already mentioned some of this. I won't go into details of every product that we do, but at the Ocean Prediction Center, we do over 150 products each day from the radio fax charts at a variety of times, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 and 96. We'll do automated 500 millibar charts for those that want that. 24-hour, 48-hour, 72-hour, 96-hour wind wave charts, as well as wave period and direction charts. We have wind wave charts and sea state analyses of the current conditions that are out there. And then on the right, we also do currently a marine weather discussion and offshore waters forecast in the coastal waters out to about 250 miles. So basically, uh, kind of encompasses the EEZs, the exclusive economic zones and NAVTEC's high frequency forecasts, as well as the high seas forecasts that we issue. Uh, we also do these for the Pacific, and then we do those in high latitudes as well. At the Ocean Prediction Center, we provide a little bit more limited suite, but still a suite of products and services that cover part of the Arctic Ocean. And I should mention that just this past year, the uh, NOAA component of the U.S. National Ice Center has joined the Ocean Prediction Center. It's the ICE Services Branch. And so the National ICE Center is still a tri-agency um, uh, a, a tri uh, organization made up of the US Navy, the Coast Guard, as well as NOAA. And the NOAA component has left from our NOAA satellite service to the National Weather Service now falls under the Ocean Prediction Center. And I think in the future, because of that, uh, because of that now relationship, we'll be able to provide uh, better decision support services, coupling both winds, waves, as well as ice for mariners traversing high latitudes. Chris mentioned the National Digital Forecast Database, and here's an example of that here. 
we can provide through seven days very specific forecasts of uh, winds in the upper right part of the screen as well as waves in the lower right part of the screen in this event that took place just a few days ago back on December 1st uh, storm force conditions as well as uh, pretty significant waves off the Atlantic coast. One thing that we're trying to do at the Ocean Prediction Center is fill in the gaps which you see in the upper left uh, with the more gridded data out over the North Pacific and the North Atlantic. And uh, because of the you know, very busy workflows that we have, um, it's, it's kind of come difficult to, to fill that in, but that's something that we want to do in the not too distant future for us to be able to provide more specific services to mariners who want to use the digital database. So how do we do it? A forecaster first you know, needs to understand what's going on in the atmosphere right now. And that's done through you know, basically observing current conditions. And how do we do that? Well, over the open ocean, satellite is very important. On the left side is an image in the Pacific taken from January 24th of 2020, showing a really strong uh, system out over the central Pacific with other low pressure systems out of the Western Aleutians, weaker low pressure centers uh, located near the Gulf of Alaska and the Northwest coast. Um, these can help us determine where low pressure centers are as well as where funnel boundaries may exist. And then we also want to look at, you know, what's going on with the winds and the seas. And as Chris mentioned, there are polar orbiters that uh, sweep the earth and give us a sense of what the wave heights are in this case near this strong low pressure system that you can see wrapped up here on satellite imagery a swath of, of wave heights came out where we've got a maximum of 59 foot seas in this in this uh, particular area uh, with the storm so we get a sense of current conditions with the satellite imagery uh, with the altimeter data to get a sense of the 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 waves and then we also use scatterometer data to get a sense of the winds this is an event off the atlantic coast back from 2018 showing a broad area of gale force winds gales and um and stronger in the hotter colors the yellows and beyond storm force winds will be in the reddish and certainly in the brown areas hurricane force winds are in these bright areas off the coast of north carolina and the virginia capes so again, very broad area of you know, really adverse conditions in this case, but the forecaster having this information can really get a sense of what's going on out there. And coupling that then with observations that we're able to get from buoys, maybe from some ships that are out there, we understand the current conditions and then we start looking at model guidance. And this is an example of a couple of sets of model guidance, the global forecast system guidance in the yellow, the, the ECMWF or European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast in the orange. And we look at this data to try to get a sense of, okay, maybe which model is covering things uh, that we think is doing it the most accurately. Um, and from the initial conditions, if we see one model handling the near term very well, we might tend to follow that model a little bit out farther in time. We also understand some of the biases that maybe some of the guidance have, and we put that into our forecast process. In this case here, the low pressure system, the stronger low over the central North Atlantic is fairly closely resolved by both the models. You know, the individual centers are a little bit different, but a weaker low coming off the coast is resolved maybe a little bit farther north in the ECMWF, a little bit farther south, maybe a little weaker in, in the GFS. And so we'll use again our knowledge with the current conditions to try to get a sense of which guidance is doing the, the best job sometimes we'll do a blend of both uh, to pull out the best forecast for you the same is true with waves and in the in the green is a wave watch guidance basically an offshoot of the gfs forecast in the blue is the uh, is a wave model from the ecmwf very similar in some cases with the highest and the lowest waves, but there's some discrepancy here, higher waves here with one guidance a little bit farther to the northeast with another. And we'll again try to you know, make sure we follow the, the model that is, is closely you know, resolving current conditions, extrapolate out into the future. So those are how we do it. And I want to mention again the, the importance of observations. And so in this case, here's a satellite image taken from July 29th of 2015 showing a strong low pressure system here with a front that's going off to the south. Nova Scotia is to the upper left. And there's a ship observation here, which may be difficult to see, showing a northwest wind of basically 65 to 70 knots, hurricane force conditions with a vessel that got very close to this low. 
If we go to the next slide, this is model guidance that we got at the same time as we got the ship report, where a low pressure system is here as opposed to here. And you can see the model guidance, well, not very far from where the low was, still enough where in this case, the model was producing southeast winds, where with the ship report, it showed indeed northwest winds, much stronger than what the model had. The model had, I think, maximum winds here, maybe 40, 45 knots, whereas the actual observation showed very accurately winds of hurricane force. And so if you look at this image, we only have a very, very few observations. Here's an observation here, 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 and a few other places, very uh, scattered, widely scattered, isolated in the oceanic environment. And if you look at like marine traffic sites, there are many more vessels out there. And globally, um, and I'm chair of the ship observations team showing this map here, globally, there are some areas where there is fairly decent coverage of observations. You know, it's kind of okay out over parts of the North Atlantic and a few parts in the North Pacific, but there are much more um, widespread areas around the globe of the hotter colors where there basically aren't very many observations. And it's important to have as many observations as we can because while satellite data does a couple of times a day when they do their swaths, give us like in this case, an indicator of what the winds are like, there are many gaps in between. And keep in mind that these orbiters are going across every, we might get a data from these orbiters maybe every like six hours or so. And so we need to have the gaps filled someplace. Ship observations can be very important to do that. And so, I wanted to show this image. This is a there this this graphic here that uh, there is a WMO standard for observational goals, and a goal is trying to get observations every 15 kilometers taken every 60 minutes. If we could just get observations every 100 kilometers every six hours, that can be kind of considered an optimum. And when we think about high resolution numerical weather prediction, getting something every 10 kilometers every 60 minutes is is even more important some of these we achieve on land over the oceans it's very rare so the more observations that we get uh, we definitely appreciate those know that they're used and if you don't get any feedback on them directly know that indirectly every forecaster that gets a chance to look at those is very appreciative and they get into the models to make the models better Chris mentioned decision support services, which is something at the Ocean Prediction Center we're, we're working hard to, to improve upon. This is an example of a, a briefing that we provide to the U.S. Coast Guard District 5, which is in turn they send out via gov delivery to let mariners know of, of maybe some issues that they may experience uh, in the next seven days off the coast of the United States out to a few hundred miles. And uh, so again, the Coast Guard sends this out via gov delivery. And with our decision support services, we also assist our core partners like the Coast Guard with things like on the left spot forecast, where if they're going for a, uh, for example, we hope it doesn't occur very often, certainly, but for a rescue or recovery mission, uh, they'll be able to get a sense of what the weather is like in and near that area to try to let the vessel know that maybe in distress what's going on also let the Coast Guard uh, personnel know what they might expect to encounter as they go out on missions like that. We've also done decision support services for things like trying to extract oil from a World War II vessel uh, that was under the ocean for many, many years to try to make sure that those who are uh, getting that, that, uh, that, that substance out from under the ground and trying to do it safely aren't gonna be affected by very high winds, seas, or swell. And so those are things we're looking at. And some possibilities with our gridded database are graphics that maybe people like, like yourselves or others who provide you services uh, could download and, and, and use. On the left is an example of a, a graphic pulled right from our national digital forecast database. On the right is a example of maybe a, a kind of a prototype of hazard ending times. So as gales begin and end or storms begin and end, the gridded database may be able to provide uh, people information of when those events will take place for better decision making. The electronic chart and display information system uh, could be an avenue where gridded data could be placed right into it. And uh, then we have maybe the future of high seas forecasting could be more from a text format like we see in the middle to maybe something more on the right. Right now, our high seas forecasts take quite a long time to type, especially in a busy time of year. They could take upwards of an hour and a half or two hours to physically type by hand. 
if we're able to provide those in a uh, quicker, uh, maybe more succinct time, uh, succinct format, and maybe provide polygons like we see on the left, these could provide uh, better ways for people to make uh, better decisions in a faster, more efficient way and give our forecasters more time to provide decision support services. We also, basically at the end, we want to provide mariners with 21st century information. This is the GFS 52-hour forecast veiled on the 9th of December in 2020. And you can see that when we do forecast by quadrants, uh, you know, we'll extend out from the lows. The hot colors are the higher winds. But notice, even when we get out here to the northeast of the low, there's very many areas where the winds really aren't that bad. And if we go to the Pacific side of things, when we focus things on low pressure systems themselves, model guidance as well as satellite data can provide us you know, much more detail with low pressure systems than they could 20 years ago. But here's a low, here's a low, there's a low, there's a low, and there's another low down here, all forecast by this model. Our high seas forecast based on this one system, if we wrote everything for every low, could be three or four pages long. And so I think as we get to the future of high seas forecasting, we will want to focus more on where the hazard's going to be as opposed to the system that's that's really maybe producing the weather because there are many more of these um, that are out there that we can actually write for and that probably that the mariner can understand. The more important thing is probably where the winds are going to be the worst, where the waves are going to be the worst, and so on. Um, we're going to be doing more forecasting and decision support at high latitudes with our um, with our relationship with the U.S. National Ice Center. And in the interest of time, I just want to move on to this this uh, last slide here, uh, near last slide, social media that we do as well. And uh, if you want to get a sense of uh, some North Atlantic hurricane force events over the 2019-2020 season, you can look at the website there. Really nice storyboard done by one of our forecasters, Tim Collins, at the Ocean Prediction Center. Facebook and Twitter handles are there. So with that, uh, Amanda, thank you very much. I'll turn it back to you, and then we can add two minutes to entertain time for some questions. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Darren. Yes. Um, so, Chris, are you on to? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So the first question is from Brenda Belonghi, and she asks, does the wave height sensing satellites work when it's cloudy? Uh, yes, the answer is that uh, the radar is at such a frequency that it's not affected much by, by clouds or light rain. It may have some issues with extreme rainfall, but uh, but yeah, that's, that, that's a wonderful instrument that uh, it's able to get us conditions uh, at the ocean in almost any kind of weather. All right, Ed Gray asks, NOAA usually gives several tracks for hurricanes. Why does it seem that the European model is usually more accurate? Well, we're not talking about hurricanes too much today. Um, this is for winter weather, uh, but I will point out that uh, when we do hurricane forecasts, it's, uh, it's using a blend of, of different models. Uh, some of the uh, global forecast system in the United States, some is indeed the ECNWF, but what tends to work best is a blend of different models together as opposed to just focusing on a single. All right, Oliver Heinrichs asks, he's asking about SpaceX. And once to, and he said, I have heard SpaceX has started to provide Wi-Fi in remote areas in the U.S. and Canada, and how to get weather out at sea. I think I think he's just asking about and more information about that. If you guys have any idea, yeah, that this is Darren. I think that there are a number of you know different entities that that are providing more and more information all the time. In Marsat was the it was the only safety net provider for many, many years. Now Iridium is, is starting to have a constellation of, of satellites that are going to uh, provide information. And I think there are, there are more to follow. I've even heard of maybe um, an agency in, in, in China might put up its own constellation of satellites soon. Um, you know, it might be hard for us to kind of keep up with, but uh, there are a lot of entities out there providing this. And hopefully you find one that works well for you uh, wherever you travel. That, that'll work well for you. 
All right, and Rob Marie just had a comment and said he wanted to say plus one for Vobra um, that small vessels can't support high speed internet. So he's definitely a fan of that. Oliver asks, what parameters or indications would give me a hint of more squalls out at sea? Is CAPE a good parameter to look at? So when it comes to, yeah, CAPE is, is, is good as long as you have, you know, lift and moisture associated with it. You, you'll, there, there could be degrees of instability, um, but uh, if, if uh, you could have a lot of instability, but if you don't have a source of lift, um, to to kind of get that that instability down to the ground um, with a thunderstorm or whatever, uh, yeah, that that you you could yeah you won't have have too much, but if you're able to look at parameters like cape or like downdraft cape, um, those could be things that if a thunderstorm was going to occur, um, then you could maybe prepare that that's an, for an environment that will be conducive to really squally weather. I don't know, if Chris, you want to add anything to that? I, I think you covered it there for the most part there. Thanks. All right, Oliver asks, with the dangers out at sea, do we collaborate with boatwatch.org? I'm not familiar with boatwatch.org. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a group I'm not, I haven't heard of. Yeah, our collaboration is is, is certainly uh, especially focused on uh, government agencies. So we'll definitely collaborate internally with different centers to make sure that our forecasts are as consistent as they can be across our boundaries. We also collaborate with the U.S. Coast Guard uh, to make sure the U.S. Navy to make sure that those forecasts are are available to them for their missions um, that, that they provide. If there was an agency that wanted to reach out to us because they weren't getting model data or because they weren't getting a specific data that they're, they need to do you know, their work, uh, they may reach out to us there, but that would be more probably towards something like the Environmental Modeling Center as opposed to directly with the Ocean Prediction Center. Um, so yeah, we probably don't do a lot of close collaboration with individual private agencies um, on a daily basis. Yeah, I will point out that the U.S. Coast Guard is becoming an increasingly important partner uh, with the, uh, the National Weather Service. And so that is our, our requirements is to assist them with their, uh, their life-saving mission. And so when they are doing search and rescue, you know, we're the ones to help them provide uh, the weather forecast. And so if they reach out to another organization like, like boatwatch.org, um, that, that would be you know, the, up to the Coast Guard, but but yes, for for search and rescue, we we work with the Coast Guard. All right, Robert David asks on the web page that Chris demonstrated, uh, what do the different categories mean for um, ten meter, thirty meter, fifty meter winds? Right. So on the marine composite page, we are uh, trying to add some additional uh, parameters to take a look at. And one that uh, we're still experimenting on is providing winds at 30 meters and at 50 meters. Uh, because as uh, mariners know, uh, the ships are getting larger and larger and that, uh, that some of them are, are much, much higher above the ocean than, than 10 meters. And so we're, we're trying to uh, provide that level information. It's still uh, experimental, so I didn't want to highlight it just yet. Uh, but we are hoping to make that available soon. All right, Babs Carrier asks, where does the NWS leave off or take over? And like, when should we view, listen um, to the weather service out, when out at sea and away from the United States? So if we go back to the, um, if I can, I got my screen up here, I'll try to go back to the med area charts. We, uh, for, for the high seas, um, the, it's usually pretty well specified there where we, where we go to, I think it's to 35 west in the Atlantic and uh, 160 east in the Pacific. And uh, then, but for the, for the charts themselves, um, we, will, we will go beyond that. So each of the each of the types of forecasts you get, offshore forecasts stay closer to the coasts, um, high seas forecast definitely farther out away from the coast, 
radio fax charts will almost expand, ex extend over the entire oceans. Um, the Weather Service is the authoritative voice, certainly in the med areas that I described before where the high seas are, but we will provide detailed information on the charts that go beyond our high seas forecasts. All right, I'm not sure if you guys can answer this, but in that same vein, David Noble asks, why is jurisdiction area 11 not divided between Japan and China, clearly? I'm not sure about that. That's that's a good question. Though. Yeah, and I have to admit, I'm not sure either, and I wish I could um, get off my screen to go back to the med areas. So I apologize for not being able to do that. But yeah, those are those are worked out through the World Meteorological Organization, um, maybe the International Oceanographic Commission, the IOC. Um, yeah, so I wish we could answer that, but I, I just can't. I apologize for that. All right, Theory Surratt asks, when crossing the transatlantic ocean from east to west, it is often recommended to add at least one Bobert on the weather forecast. Why is this a rule of thumb and or good wisdom? So that that feedback is good to hear. Um, I, I think that the only thing I can think of is that because mariners want to make sure that they avoid the worst of the worst conditions, that they may actually do a kind of a plus one to the to the scale uh, to make sure that they avoid it. Also, maybe because in the past there have been instances where uh, the mariner has gotten into uh, adverse conditions and developed as a rule of thumb that, hey, I get this forecast. Let me just add add kind of one category to make sure that uh, I, I'm prepared for the conditions that I might I might see. You know, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, we we forecast, um, especially in, in the in the high seas. Uh, the offshores the, the and the offshore waters we forecast for the winds and not the gusts and so they're 10 meter winds and so if your wind instrument for example is up near 50 60 meters um, you could experience winds that are much you know somewhat greater for sure than what you'd notice at the 10 meter level so uh, you know that's something else to keep in mind we forecast 10 meter winds and and so the conditions that we forecast will be that and we typically don't include gusts in in the forecasts either so you'll notice there'll be times it'll become more gusty than what you might experience and again the winds at higher levels will be higher than what you might see in in, in the forecast so that could have something to do with it as well all right Dedar, i this is i think going to go for chris um, I know this is a hurricane question, but figured I'd ask. During the time period of Marco and Laura in the Gulf of Mexico, he had to um, avoid, you know, the rough weather. Uh, and he said almost all forecasts from Navy and NOAA had low confidence in the forecasts noted on their reports. Question, how is the prediction confidence level predicted and what should mariners be aware of when considering the confidence level? Right. So part of the confidence has to do with the computer models that we're using for track and maximum winds for hurricanes. And they, uh, a big a red flag is when you see a lot of uh, variability or a divergence or a huge spread of the different track models. Um, so that's, we when we make a forecast at the National Hurricane Center, it's a deterministic exact five day forecast. So they all look alike. Um, but some have more confidence than others. And in the case of the, um, you know, the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico this year, uh, it, uh, there, there was a lot of uncertainty. In this case, you had two storms interacting with one another. And that, that adds to the complexity and the, the amount of solutions that could occur. Um, so that, that's, that's how we determine it. It's, it's fairly subjective on, on the amount of confidence, um, but it's usually, when we see the computer model track track models diverge. Okay, this question is for Darren from Paul Suffren. Do you ever get ship observations of icing or icing rates? If not, would they be useful observations to have? We, we get very few. 
And, and yes, they would be nice to have. We actually did an effort at the Ocean Prediction Center. This is back several years ago. I think it's from 2015, where we did a you know, survey of folks trying to see if they could uh, help us understand how much icing they got and uh you know kind of sense the observations that they might get during icing during times of you know severe icing conditions or even lighter icing and i think we got like nine reports back which wasn't enough to get a good sample size of you know what icing conditions were typically like so yes where they can be provided um yes yeah, certainly though those are very very helpful they'll help us validate the the heavy freezing spray warnings that we'll issue or just to understand better what's going on out there when we might just forecast, for example, light to moderate freezing spray, which can still be a problem, certainly uh, for, in particular, the, the smaller to medium-sized vessels. So thanks, good question. Okay, Kirk Hackler has a two-part question. Um, first, he just wanted to say on the 21st infographics, please make sure that lat long is easily visible. And then the second, he says, is there a listing of addresses of the various prediction centers? For example, I have OPC addresses for the 500 mil bar charts, et cetera. And how do I find the Atlantic address and more of the wonderful prediction charts? I think other people were asking to send out a list of the web pages that both Chris and Darren have provided throughout the, um, the talks. Yeah, we can, we can follow up and then send that out to the attendees of the websites that would be most of use for, for Atlantic, both the tropical North Atlantic and the high latitudes. Okay, from, this is from Andrew Halliburton. We've heard that 5G is expected to negatively impact remote sensing from satellite sensors. Can you elaborate? Um, the last I heard, I thought that there was a compromise that was going to be worked out, but I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm still trying to recover from the hurricane season, so uh, I'm not sure. Darren, have you heard any more about that issue? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, it. Um, the question was about um, 5G, and it'll negatively impact satellite sensors, and if we could elaborate. Yeah, right now, yeah, I can't, I really can't elaborate. I don't know too much about that issue from my perspective. A lot of that is being handled at levels of the organization well above us. And, and, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, Camille DeBant says that we, as I assume many cruisers, use programs like Predict Wind but we have experienced a lot of discrepancies between models and found ourselves in worse weather conditions than planned. How do we, how can we make sure we get more accurate information? Well, usually those uh, private providers are using a single model, whether it's the global forecast system or the European model. And so that doesn't have the benefit of the information that our forecasters have, their understanding and intuition and ability for them to adjust the forecast um, so I, I you know taking a look at those private sites and, and the indiv individual models is nice but it just gives you one possible solution um, so having access to the official forecast from the national weather service um, either via our, our high seas or our offshore zones uh, or the graphics or the grids uh, I think that would be my suggestion is, is to look at the official source and not just a, a private vendor providing a one model output. Yeah, and this is Darren, I'd agree with that. The, 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 you know, most of us are going to do probably like some sort of ensemble approach. And what I mean by that is you know, you're going to use the vendor or the application that's that's that you feel most comfortable with, but certainly you know, supplement that with information from uh, the authoritative source, whether it's you know, the Ocean Prediction Center, the the, uh, the Hurricane Center, TAF B, um, Honolulu, wherever you have to get access to, wherever you are, you know, going on your voyage, you make sure you're able to download the information there, so you can compare it, get a sense to see maybe where the discrepancies are, and and hopefully make some some better decisions that way. So yeah, you focus on one, you might get like Chris was saying, the you know, one one solution from one set of models nicely packaged, but still only that one solution. Uh, whereas if you incorporate some 
uh, National Weather Service information. With that, for example, you'll get uh, you know, some forecast or manipulated information, if you will, that incorporates the forecaster's knowledge and all the models that the forecast is able to look at. Camille also asks, what's the best way to help with giving observations? So the probably the best way is joining the uh, Voluntary Observing Ship Program. And if you, if you do a search on uh, National Weather Service VOS, Victor Oscar Sierra, uh, that's how you can, you can join, uh, the, join the program. Um, we are looking at ways in the future to be able to look at what we'll call independent or third party, kind of like you go crowdsourcing, if you will, to allow um, more individuals who may have, let's say just a pressure sensor, for example, to get that information into the global telecommunication system so the forecaster can see it and a model can ingest it. Um, but right now, the, 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 the formal mechanism to get observations to uh, a forecaster or something like the National Weather Service into its models is through BOSS. Okay, we still have um, quite a number of questions. Do you guys want to keep going or should I go ahead and write these down and then you guys can respond later? Yeah, well, why don't we uh, respond later? That would be fine. Okay. Right, I'd be happy to, to work with Darren to uh, okay, get great. back there as well as uh, we can provide the uh, list of websites that folks asked and as well as these these powerpoints um, we, uh, okay. both, uh, make them available to the public there. all right sounds good thank you everyone for all your questions and comments and we'll be here same time tomorrow for part two of the wonder weather webinar thank you very much thank you